And as we did yesterday, go ahead and write down your hypothesis. What do you think is going to happen? Then I'll collect those papers. And then um, I'll actually turn those back with yesterday's papers, probably turn those back tomorrow. So you'll have what you initially thought would happen. You observe what actually does happen. And then we can write a lab from there. Remember, I'm having you write down your hypothesis in advance because it's human nature to convince yourself that you understood something before you actually do. And so if I were to tell you or to show you the experiment and then tell you to write down what you thought was going to happen before you saw it, you really can't do that. You, you know. But hopefully, just even from yesterday's experiments, as you look at your hypotheses of what you thought was going to happen yesterday and what actually happened, you say, well, wait a minute, my thinking was off. I was thinking about it exactly backwards, I think the comment was made, okay? If a couple of you did that, you were thinking exactly backwards. Well, that's good. And hopefully by when you write up this lab and explain what you actually saw and explain how it actually happened, that'll reinforce in, in your own mind that these are the principles at play. This is how it actually worked. So what I'm going to do is I have three different graduated cylinders over there, a large one and two smaller ones. I'm going to take, the, or the larger one has um, canola oil in it. Into that larger graduated cylinder, I'm going to pour water. And something's going to happen. Okay? Right now, just kind of think to yourself, what do you think is going to happen? I'll, let you, I'll tell you this, it's not a chemical reaction. So nothing's going to react. Okay? But something is going to physically happen in there. When I, add the canola, when I add the water to the canola oil, something is going to happen. And then, after that stabilizes, and it won't take very long, I'm going to pour the maple syrup into the large graduated cylinder. And something extremely similar to what happened the first time is going to happen. Okay? What is going to happen? Just, no, write it down. Write it down as your hypotheses, as your hypothesis, and then turn it in. Once we have them all collected, I'll go ahead and do it. It won't take but a few moments but hopefully to reinforce either that you did or did not understand it as we talk about it. Remember, the subject today, which will help you in your hypothesis, is density. We're talking about density today. So if that gives you a hint in, in the direction of what may be happening, then go ahead and include that in your hypothesis. Some of you may not, hopefully you're familiar with the term density, but you may not be. By the end of class, you will be and then reinforced by the experiment, okay? So once you have those, go ahead and pass them over to the side, and if you all would, over here on this first row, put them on the desk right there. Let me go over here and get the graduated cylinders. Now yesterday I recorded some of that experiment offline, so I actually did the food coloring experiment a second time after you left class and put it, embedded it into yesterday's video online. So if you wanna watch the experiment again, it's online for you to see another take on that. So this is quite a large graduated cylinder. It can hold 500 milliliters. We're only going to put 150 milliliters in here. So it looks relatively small. But to this 50 milliliters of canola oil, I'm going to add 50 milliliters of H2O liquid. You call it water. You weren't thinking exactly off. Bring this uh, out of autofocus. I don't know if it'll show really well on the camera or not. But what's happened? Describe what you see. Does anybody need to see it closer? Or is this good enough? Probably good enough. What's happened? Okay, they're separate. I put them in in a specific order so that you could see the separation better because I knew that it was going to lay out in this way. I started with the oil so that as I poured the water into it, the water would have to put itself underneath the oil. And then I poured the syrup in so that the syrup would come in and have to go underneath the oil and the water to get to the bottom. If I had constructed this by putting the syrup in first 
and then the water in second, and then the oil in third, you could have said they just stack on top of each other. But because I entered them as oil was there, I added water which had to go to the bottom, I added syrup which had to go to the bottom, hopefully it's reinforcing the idea that it's not simply the order you, that you put them in the tube, right? Whatever's first is at the bottom, whatever's second is in the middle, whatever's last is on the top. But there's something else at play, and that play is the densities. The whole topic for today's lecture and discussion. Differing densities. How do they lay out? What is, if it's based on density, what do you think this represents? Moving from bottom to top, how does the density change? We talked about periodic properties, remember? As I go up and to the right, the electronegativity increases. What's happening here with regard to the densities? You're thinking exactly opposite. <laughs> good. That's fine. That's a good, honest mistake. Thank you for speaking in a real voice rather than going, it goes to the top. Okay. So what we have going on here, we're going to find out because the reason I was taking those measurements over there is I was finding out the volume, the 50 milliliters, and I was taking the mass because the mass divided by the volume is the density. And we're going to actually use numbers and not just have a, oh, it's syrup, water, canola oil, but rather it's syrup because syrup has a, this syrup, this particular sample of syrup has a specific density. And this water has a density, and this canola oil has a density, and we're going to find that what they, the way they lay out is the most dense goes to the bottom. The least dense goes to the top. And everything in the middle layers itself out according to, from, from bottom to top is decreasing densities, or from top to bottom, increasing densities. The densest one goes at the bottom. The least dense goes to the top. And we'll explain why as we go through this module, okay? Hopefully I won't knock that over. It'll be a, quite a crash. That's my own gear too, so I kind of want to take good care of it. It's not like I can just write another PO and replace it. You have to come out of my pocket. And I'm selfish that way, right? You know that about me. <laughs> Donate so much stuff, it's crazy. So this was experiment 0603. And hopefully you can remember the, the experiments we've done. You need to, when you do the lab, actually write down what you saw. So if you'd want to just jot down a few notes in your notes to remind yourself of what you saw, but it's pretty straightforward for the most part. Remember. The jug full of steam, when it cools, what happens? It implodes. Okay. You add food coloring to the different temperature waters, what happens? The warmest water has the greatest energy, greatest temperature, means the molecules are moving the fastest, and moving the most, therefore the food coloring mixes quicker because all the molecules are in motion. The warmer they are, the faster they move, the faster they mix. That's why the food coloring dispersed itself evenly so quickly in the hot. And why, when I did the redo, I had much colder water. I'd sat in ice for the whole period, so it was able to get to a true 32 degrees. And on the video replay, the cold, the food coloring, like I described to you, goes to the bottom and slowly colors up. The room temperature has coloring on the top and the bottom with streaks through it, and the warm turns purple almost immediately. You drop the food coloring in, it automatically starts self-mixing. So there's no mechanical mixing. That's purely the motion of the molecules of still water. When we look at it, we would say it's still. It's motionless. But the fact is the molecules in it are moving all the time. Even when they're frozen, their motion is known as what? Vibrations. Vibrations, right. Vibrations. All right, so density. Density is, by definition, an object's mass divided by the volume. Is that notes or homework that you guys pass every day? Okay. So prepared and unprepared. Okay, that's a little bit other. Um, so density, an object's mass divided by, by the volume, by the volume it takes up. The symbol for that is the symbol rho. Rho looks like a, it's a Greek letter. It's a Greek lowercase rho right there. It looks like a cursive P. So. Don't try not to use capital P. Some people use that for pressure. For right now, it's to use a lowercase cursive P. That's rho. That stands for density. And density is the mass of the object divided by the volume of the object. How much stuff does it have in it divided by how much space does it take up? 
And the way I'd like you to think about this is how much stuff is packed into that space? That's what density is. How much stuff can I get into a space? In this case, I had 50 milliliters of water, 50 milliliters of syrup, and 50 milliliters of canola oil. I had basically the same volume of each one of them. So what I would argue is, if I have the same volume of each thing, that syrup, as, because it's the most dense, has the most stuff. Remember, matter is stuff, real technical term. It has the most stuff packed into the same size. It's like having a measuring cup. How much salt can I pack into it? And how much sugar can I pack into it? And how much flour can I pack into it? The same volume. And if they're all the same volume, the higher mass would tell me that I've got more stuff in that, in that space. Okay. But since we don't always use the exact same amounts of different things, what we can do is take the mass of whatever we have and divide it by the volume that it takes up, the space that it takes up, and that will give us a unit of density, how much stuff is in a given volume. So the terminology here too, this was in the lab, which you may or may not read, hopefully you do read, even the labs that we don't do technically the way the book says to do them. This is something that I'm giving to you because this to me is one of the most humorous ways that I get to tell which of you just Google answers and which ones of you read the book and come up with the right answer. Every year, I'm giving away my little personal joke that I get to laugh at every year to you so you won't make me laugh, okay? Here's the deal. One of your homework questions asks you to give the definitions of qualitative and quantitative. And I shared with you before that in my doctoral studies, we have different kinds of research that we do. It's quantitative and qualitative. Quantitative is basically by the numbers. Qualitative is where you go and do personal interviews with people and you find out it's, it's a touchy-feely kind of a thing, okay? And those are the definitions, if you Google them, that'll come to the top and you'll put on your paper and get wrong. The same word is used slightly differently in chemistry than it's used in the social sciences. Okay, so you need to know the chemistry terms for it. And I'm gonna give you the bare bones, simplest way to think about it, is that quant qualitative is to observe it and quantitative is to measure it. What I did here is described, it could have been done qualitatively and I could just say, I'm going to take about 50 milliliters of this and about 50 milliliters of that and about 50 milliliters of this and I'm going to throw them all together and I'm going to see what it does and I'm going to describe it. Okay? That would be qualitatively. This is what I observed. Okay? But what we're going to do is take this qualitative experiment we've just done and we're going to actually make it quantitative as well. Because I went through while you were getting ready for class and I measured the volumes of each of the three liquids and I measured the mass of each of the three liquids and so we can compute the density of each of the three liquids to a certain number of decimal places and then we can show by the numbers that it laid out the way it did, not simply by looking at it. Because I've said to you now that the syrup is the most dense, the water is the middle dense and the canola oil is the least dense, how do you know? I could just be having fun with you and like teaching you wrong stuff so that you fail, right? Nah, I wouldn't do that. But I'll sh we'll, sh we'll go look at the numbers later and say, hey, how do you know this is the most dense? Why? Because it has a higher mass per a given volume than any of the other two other objects. Than any of the three, it has the highest stuff per volume unit. In this case, oil has the least stuff per volume unit, which gives it a lower density. It also means that we could take a fourth substance and put it in there. And we could estimate its density if it falls between two that we know. Or if we were to measure its volume and its mass, we could know its density and speculate where it's gonna lay out when we pour it in there and watch it go there. Maybe that will, something we'll do later. Because I hadn't thought of that before, but that would work out well for us too. But for our purposes in chemistry, qualitative has to be, do with observing it, seeing it, and describing it. Quantitatively means measure it out. If you're told an experiment to take 50 milliliters qualitatively, that means you kind of just pour it in there and you get about 50. 51, 49, somewhere in there, it's fine. It doesn't matter exactly how much. It's kind of like when you go to boil an egg and your mom says, okay, put, put three, you know, two cups of water in, in the smallest saucepan. Does she really expect you to measure it out real perfectly to get exactly, no, because you're gonna boil an egg in it and then just throw it down the drain. So when she says, put about two cups, she's telling you to do it qualitatively. If she said, make sure you have 73.2 milliliters, well, that's quantitatively. Now I've got to actually pull out a graduated cylinder and measure it out because there's a reason for it to be a specific amount. OK? 
okay? Those are the differences. Quantitatively, get specific, measure it out. Qualitatively, observe it, ballpark it, give me a general idea. All right. Example 6-1. You know what? I didn't bring a book today. So either I borrow one or someone reads to me. Here you go. Oh, somebody who's not using their book. There we go. Thank you. Thank you for being one of three people that don't have their book open. Okay. I, okay, I would be the fourth, but now I'm the third. Now you're the third. You would have been the fourth. Here we go. Example 6-1. A gold miner, it's on page 219, a gold miner found a nugget of pure gold. Okay? So he's going to retire and live the high school dream, right? Not quite. He measures its dimensions and then calculates that its volume is 0 0.125 liters. Knowing that the density of gold is 19.3 grams per milliliter, calculate the mass of the miner's nugget. So what do we know? What's given to us in the problem? It has a volume of 0 0.125 liters. This is all worked out in your book. We're just talking through it. We know that it has a volume and that it has, if it's gold, and we're told that it's gold, then gold has a density of 19.3 grams per milliliter. Now here's the deal. Everything, every substance has a unique density. Every element, we look at a pure element, every pure substance has an identifiable density. So you can work this both ways. If I know the density, I can in this case figure out the, ma or the mass. If I know the mass, I can figure out the density. If I know, you know, like an equation. If I know two of the three variables, I can solve for the third. Gold has a density of 19.3 grams per milliliter. So given that it's gold, we're going to use that density. However, if we don't know the density of something and we find out that it happens to have a density of 19.3 grams per milliliter, per milliliter, it's probably gold if it's a pure substance. Okay. So it has a volume. In this example, the gold nugget has a certain volume. The gold has a Gold, we know, always has this specific density, and so we use the formula rho equals mass divided by volume, density equals mass divided by volume, but we're solving for mass, so we have to rearrange it as mass is equal to the density times the volume. Hopefully you see the, the algebraic rearrangement there. We've got to solve for m, and so we have to multiply both sides by volume, v, and we rearrange for solving for mass, it's mass equals rho v. Mass equals the density times the volume. Think about the units. Its density, in this case, is generally grams per milliliter. Okay? If density is in grams per milliliter and I multiply that by a volume, I've got mass per volume times volume. The volumes cancel out and I'm left with mass. In this case, the mass is equal to 19.3 because we're told it's gold and gold has a density of 19.3 grams per milliliter and multiplied by the volume of 125 milliliters. Where did I get that from? 0 0.125 liters. 0 0.125 liters is equal to 125 milliliters. You still need to go back and do the unit multipliers. Go ahead and do that. But basically, we multiply it by 1,000 to convert it from liters to milliliters. Right? How many significant places do I have in 0 0.125? Three. And I need to maintain three. Good. How many do I have here? Three. So I'm good. I can make that. I can make that change. If I couldn't get enough sig figs down there, I'd have to use scientific notation. But I can, so we're good. So we just do the math there, and the math turns out to be, strictly doing the math, it's 2,412.5 grams. That would be the mass. That's a big, stinking piece of gold, right? What is my answer to the equation, though? What is the mass that I can report? Okay, I know you're looking towards the end of it, so you're going to figure out really quickly that it has to do with sig figs, right? Because I'm multiplying two, so my significant figures, I can only, what? Times three in the first part. 
So I can only have the same number as the least, right? I've got 3 and 3, so I can only take it to 3. So 2,412.5 grams to three significant figures is 2,410 grams. Writing it as 2,412.5 grams is not more accurate. It's less accurate than 2,410 grams because of the sig figs. Okay. So given a volume of a known object, we can compute the mass of 2,410 grams. It's a little bit more than, well, what's a kilogram? A pound is 2.2, right? <coughs> okay, higher math, we won't go there. So the math, this just example works out 2,410. On your own then, ask this question. Let me go back to this last one just for a second. When we talk about the volume, you will often hear them say that they found the volume of something. Now, if I give you a nice cube and say compute the volume, you go, oh, that's easy. I can measure the width times the height times the depth. Multiply those three numbers together, boom, there, I've got my volume. How did he measure the volume of a gold nugget Any guesses? And I'm going to tell you, it's not an approximation. It's, it's an actual real number. It's an actual really, it's going to be as precise as your instrument to figure this out. Okay. If I had, I don't right now, but let's say that I had a marble. And I had this full of water. And I had a marble. And I read the volume on here, and I drop the marble in. The, what will happen to the volume? What, what, it'll rise, won't it? Does that make sense to everybody? If I have this full of water, and I measure what the vo I read what the volume is, and I drop something in it, that'll make the volume go up, and I'll read the new number, and I subtract them. So how would you find the volume of a gold nugget? I'd take a graduated cylinder, fill it to a certain point, read the level, drop the object in the water, assuming that it sinks, that will displace a certain amount of volume, which will cause this to rise. I'll read the new level, I'll subtract the old level from that, and the difference is the difference of the volume I put in it. Okay? So I want you to be familiar with that process, because that's important to understand some of the questions and how to do some of the operations later on, is I can find the volume of something that's really easy because it's nice and straight, it's, it's, a, it's a cube, or it's an object that's geometrically exact, and we can measure it, and, and then multiply the height times the width times the depth. But more often than not, you're going to take a volume of a liquid, put it inside of that, and see how much it displaces. And it displaces what it is, the volume that it has. Okay. So in this next question, will cubes of frozen rubbing alcohol float or sink in liquid alcohol? Now, we talked about conversion from phase, right? Phase changes yesterday. We're talking about the same material in two different phases, the solid phase and the liquid phase. And I said to you that there's certain rules that apply to virtually everything except for water and a few other exceptions, okay? You're going to be expected to know that water is the exception. If they're dealing with any other exception, they're going to tell you. So they, they would say, they would either say it's this, this material, this substance, or it's water, or they would say that it's this other substance, which is an exception to the standard process or standard paradigm. So telling you that frozen rubbing alcohol, will it float or sink in liquid alcohol? Just ask yourself the general question, does anything that's solid, except for water, float or sink when it's in a liquid of the same substance? Another way, now that we've taken this and moved it to density, say which is more dense, liquid or solid rubbing alcohol? Which is more dense? 
Remember, density is how much stuff you can pack into a certain space. And if we use our hand gestures, gas, liquid, solid. Where can you pack more in? Which phase packs more stuff in? Another way to say that is, where are they closer together? Solids. solids, right. The gases are flying all over the place. The liquids are in proximity moving around. But the solids, boom, boom, they lock into a real tight matrix and they vibrate. Okay? So you get more stuff in the solid phase than you do in the liquid phase. And you get more stuff in the liquid phase than you do in the gaseous phase. Which is why for most things, the solid is the most dense, the liquid is the me medium density, and the gas is the least dense. There are a few exceptions, one of those being water. Because water is the most dense in the liquid phase, it's less dense in the solid phase, and it's much less dense in the gaseous phase. Okay. So one way to approach this question is maybe to think of water, and this is what I do, so if you think of it a different way, don't forget the way you think of it. I think of water and then I consider it the exception. So I ask myself, hmm. Will ice cubes float or sink in a glass of water? They float, and that's the exception. So what must the answer be here? They sink. Why? Frozen cubes of rubbing alcohol will be more dense than liquid rubbing alcohol. And it's more dense, so therefore it's going to sink to the bottom. It's going to act like the syrup. It's more dense than the other things that are in there. And so if I were to put solid cubes of rubbing alcohol into liquid rubbing alcohol, it would sink to the bottom because it's not going to act like water. It's the exception. It's, water is an exception. Okay? So anytime you're talking about waters and so, uh, liquids and solids being together, what's going to be on the top and what's going to be on the bottom? What's going to be on the top in water is the solid, which means what's going to be on the bottom of everything else is the solid. We talked yesterday about, in biology, how the ponds freeze from the top down, not the bottom up, because water is an exception. If it was full of anything else, in this case full of rubbing alcohol, the pond would freeze from the bottom up. And whatever was able to support life in rubbing alcohol would die because it's frozen because it would freeze from the bottom up. But water is the exception, so it freezes from the top down. Why? Because ice has less density than liquid water, and it floats to the top and forms that crust. It freezes over and holds that energy inside. So it will sink because the frozen rubbing alcohol has a higher density than the liquid rubbing alcohol. On your own. 6.5. The density of silver is 10.5 grams per cubic centimeter. What do you remember about our conversions? Grams per cubic centimeter. What's another way I could say that? What is a cubic centimeter equal to? By definition, a cubic centimeter is a milliliter, right? 1 cc equals 1 cm cubed equals 1 ml. Okay, so when they give you a question like this, it says the density of silver is 10.5 grams per cubic centimeter. You can immediately say well, that's 10.5 grams per milliliter because a cubic centimeter is a milliliter. They're the same thing, different name. A jeweler makes a silver bracelet out of 0 0.200 kilograms of silver. What is the volume in milliliters? So here they're going to tell you how much silver is used and what the density of silver is. And they're asking you, when he drops that bracelet into the water, how much is the volume going to raise? See, we're using the same formula, given that the density of gold, excuse me, the density of silver is 10.5 grams per cubic centimeter, or 10.5 grams per milliliter, same thing. That the mass of the bracelet is 0 0.200 kilograms. That's how much stuff, how much silver is in the bracelet. So I know how much stuff, and I know how much stuff per milliliter, so I can compute the milliliters. I just have to take the formula and rearrange it, this time rearranging for volume. Volume is equal to the mass divided by the density. 
I've got mass divided by mass divided by volume. Those units give me volume. Okay? So since we're working with the volume is equal to the mass divided by the density, I just plug in the numbers. Mass is 200 grams. See, grams. 200 grams because over here at 0 0.200 kilograms, I have three significant figures. Density, the, the general unit for density is grams per milliliter, so I'm going to drive for that unit most of the time. It has to be a mass per volume, but the default is grams per milliliter. So 0 0.200 kilograms is the same as 200 grams because they have the same number of significant figures. The density was given to me as 10.5 grams per cubic centimeter, but I know that that's the same thing as a gram per milliliter. And so 200 divided by 10.5 gives me 19.0 milliliters. And in this case, let me back up one. It stays 19.0 milliliters because I have three sig figs divided by three sig figs, and so my answer is to three sig figs. It's not 19. It's actually more accurate to be 19.0. It would be less accurate to be 19.00, right? More imprecise. I think we've got one more. Yeah, on your own, 6.6. Six. A gold miner tries to sell some gold that he found in a nearby river. Okay. The person who is thinking about purchasing the gold measures the mass and the volume of one nugget. Okay. Mass, he put it on a triple beam balance and said, here's how much stuff is in this nugget. Volume, he dropped it in a graduated cylinder with fluid in it and saw the level rise and read the difference. That's the volume. The mass is 1.56 kilograms and the volume is 0 0.81 liters. 0 0.081 liters. Is this really gold? Well, in order for it to really be gold, it would have to have the density of gold. And that's why they give you the hint. Remember that the density of gold is 19.3 grams per milliliter. So if this nugget has a density of 19.3 grams per milliliter, we can say it's gold. But if it doesn't, it's fool's gold. It's not gold, right? So we do the math. The mass of the nugget is 1.56 kilograms, and the volume of the nugget is 0 0.081 liters. Those are given to you in the problem. We know that the formula, or excuse me, we're also given that the density of gold is 19.3 grams per milliliter. If it's gold, that's going to be its density. Question is, is it gold? Well, let's compute the density. The density is ro uh, the rho. Density is the mass divided by the volume. In this case, the, mass of, or the density of the nugget is equal to the mass of the nugget divided by the volume of the nugget. The mass of the nugget is 1,560 grams, okay? Three sig figs, three sig figs, I can do it. Divided by 81, 0 0.081 liters or 81 milliliters. Two sig figs, two sig figs. That computes out to be 19.259 grams per milliliter. Question, is it gold? It's not. Because we can only measure this out to two sig figs, right? The closest we can say is it's 19 grams per milliliter. 19.3 is beyond our ability to actually compute with integrity. But because our measurements are not precise enough, we don't have enough significant figures, we would say, yes, that's gold. Because it falls within the range of our ability to compute. We can only have two sig figs, so our answers would be 18, 19, or 20 in that ballpark. 21, 22, they'd all be two digits, right? 19, 19.3, yeah, 19.3 is within reason, given the numbers I have to compute. How yeah. much in your book does um, 1.56 minus 1.5 Do you have a periodic table in front? So they might be different printings. Does anybody else see that difference in there? Page 220 on your own 6.6. .6? OK. 
okay, if you have 19 or 15.4, do you have a periodic table on your front cover? You do? Okay. And everybody that has 1560 has no periodic table on the front cover? Right, so they're different printings. Same, see that's the frustration with this is there's different printings of the same edition. So you can't say third edition, it's not enough. You ought to say third edition, first printing, third edition, second printing. And to get a rata sheets for those printings is a little difficult. So there, there are more than just this one in the book. But yeah, my book does say 1560. But see, we went through and calculated what was the actual density of the nugget, and does the density of the nugget match the density of gold? To our ability to calculate, yes, it does. Therefore, it is gold, and therefore, if you were this person and you could make a deal, you would buy it. If it weren't, if it was 22 or 23 or 7 or 8, you go, no, that's not even gold. It may look like gold, it may taste like gold, but it's not gold. Okay, it might have luster, you might be able to shine it up, sparkly, it's pyrite, it's fool's gold, or something else. So you could buy the claim, but then have nothing of any value in it. So. Actually, I think that's my last slide for today. We can press on for just a couple minutes. And this is really review because they have to present information sometimes twice. Sometimes, like we've talked about reactions before, and we haven't really even studied reactions yet, but I use some terminology before we learn it. It's just part of, part of this thing where everything is related to everything else. It just happens. So we've already been talking about H2O, and it's a phase change. And when the phase change occurs, it has exception. And this is what they cover next in here, is that ice or solid water takes up more volume than liquid volume of the same amount. So the same amount of stuff takes up more space in ice than it does as liquid. And so since it has the same mass but a greater volume, it gives it a lower density. Again, we've already discussed this. Even today, we've already discussed this, so I'm going to move on pretty quickly. That's why, because it has a lesser density, that is why ice floats on liquid water, because of its density. Not because of what it is, not because it's solid, but because it has a lower density. Sometimes you can find liquids, for example, that have a lower density than some solids, and that's when the solid sinks. Or solids that have a lesser density than the fluid they're on, that's why they float. That's what you deal with with the boat, for example, when it gets water in, on, inside. When does it sink? It doesn't sink right away, does it? There's issues of displacement and density and all the other things that come into play, but it's related to this idea. What does the object have in terms of its density and how is it going to respond to the other pieces of matter that's around it? Imagine if there was a really, really dense gas that we put in there. And the gas was so dense that the gas went to the bottom. Could it happen? Sure, if its density is that high. Oh, by the way, this is where it tends to happen, that gases are least dense, okay? Not only within their element, but also relative to other elements. That gases tend to be the least dense, liquids tend to be medium density, and solids tend to be the most dense, with exceptions being water and a few other unique cases. Okay. This is kind of where we get into section six, which is chemical reactions and equation equilibrium, or chemical equations and balanced equations. Um, I'm going to press on just for a minute here for maybe a slide or two but we'll pick up here tomorrow. So we're kind of pre-learning something we're going to cover tomorrow. When you're burning coal, I want you to just kind of think about this idea. There's a chemical reaction that's taking place when you burn coal. You're taking carbon, and coal is predominantly carbon. Okay? So when you're burning coal, you're burning carbon. Carbon mixes with oxygen in the heat to burn. The reaction we see burning is a reaction taking place. It's the energy for the reaction. When carbon and oxygen burn, they produce carbon dioxide. Okay. The equation for that, this is kind of like, if you think about the qualitative, this is like, talk to me, tell me what's, what's going on here. Okay, carbon's burning with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide. What's that look like for chemists? Well, it's carbon and oxygen are reacting to produce carbon dioxide. You, sh you, should, be, you should be familiar with all these, carbon, Oxygen, it's homonuclear diatomic, so O2, it's not going to come as an O. And carbon dioxide, okay, 
you probably knew that even before you knew why it was carbon dioxide. You, you didn't think, oh, it's a covalent molecule, it has two oxygens, therefore I need to use the prefix di. No, you just, it's one of those things you kind of know before you come to chemistry, right? The carbon and oxygen, but you didn't know that it's homonuclear diatomic, but they react together pr to produce CO2. What we're going to get into now is adding even more information to this equation by the use of phase symbols. There are four different phases of matter, okay? Four different phases. First one, solids. The little S in parentheses is a symbol for a solid, okay? Liquid, lowercase l in parentheses. Pretty difficult so far, right? G for a gas, okay? And the $25 question, Mr. S, don't make me get the eraser out. Huh, what? Um, the last phase symbol here we're gonna talk about is aqueous. Now, aqueous in itself is not strictly a phase. There's four phases of matter, solid, liquid, gas, and plasma. We're not good in getting into plasma here. Okay, but think of these more as the state of the material, solid, liquid, gas, and aqueous. Aqueous is AQ, and it means it's dissolved in water. So if I said I have NaCl, S, sodium chloride, solid, well then you would say you got a pile of sodium chloride, a pile of salt in your hand, right? Yeah, that's NaCl, S, NaCl, solid. But if I said I had NaCl, aqueous, then you would say, he's got salt water. I have salt, but it's in water. It's dissolved in water. So when you talk about an aqueous solution, that means whatever it is, is dissolved in water. Okay? So solids, liquids, gases, and aqueous solutions. And when we write our chemical equations out, we're going to start adding the phase symbols. Now for every chemical reaction, we have reactants and products. The reactants react to produce the products. Pretty straightforward. In this case, carbon and oxygen react to produce carbon dioxide. The reaction is combustion, it's burning. So carbon and oxygen react through combustion to produce carbon dioxide. But a little bit how this happens, if you think about O2, you know now that's a homonuclear diatomic and it's held together by two bonds, right? Two covalent bonds. But when you have the CO2 molecule from your Lewis structures, you know that you put the carbon in the middle and you put two oxygens on the outside. The process of burning is the energy required to take those two oxygens, break them apart, and rearrange them on the carbon to bring them back to form the molecule. Okay? So I have a carbon and an oxygen molecule. That molecule has to be broken up into two atoms and has to then be rebuilt as a CO2. What does it look like in its phase form? You've got solid carbon, a chunk of coal, solid, combusting with an oxygen molecule that's in the gaseous phase to produce carbon dioxide that's in a gas phase. So I have a solid and a gas that when I put energy into it, produces a gas. Strictly speaking, what does it look like to me when I burn a piece of coal, it looks to me like the coal is slowly disappearing because the solid is slowly turning into a part of a gas molecule. Is it truly disappearing? Is it becoming nothing out of something? No. It's just being rearranged into a different form. And in that other form, that phase to us appears to be invisible, but it's still there. Okay, it goes from a solid to a gas. We're going to pick up on other combustions and those symbols and the equations tomorrow. Tomorrow I will also put up on the board in the beginning the masses and the volumes of the three substances, canola oil, water, and, and syrup, and you can use those numbers when you do your lab. And we'll talk about the lab write-up as well.